What's up AP World History students? This is Amanda with Fiveable, and I've got for you today time period two, everything you need to know about Key Concept 2.2. That's empires and civilizations in the classical era. So let's take a look at this key concept. So there are several classical empires that you need to know about, and I'm gonna kind of take you through each one and show you exactly what the most important information will be so that you don't get bogged down in tons and tons of details. Some textbooks even write a whole chapter for each of these civilizations, but you really wanna pay attention to the most important aspects of each one. So in Persia, the things to know about Persia is that they had actually a couple of different empires, the Achaemenid, the Parthian, the Sassanid. Um, another important key term would be the royal roads. Um, that's important because it shows how Persia connected to each other, right? If you're, if you're expanding your empire, how do you get a message across? How do you trade? How do you share resources with your own empire? Royal roads is how they did it. Uh, a couple of key things to know is that their major belief system was called Zoroastrianism. It's kind of an early form of monotheism. Christianity is, is kind of similar to it. Some of the major people that you should know would be Darius and Cyrus. And I'm going to make some more videos more specific about them, but being able to connect them to Persia is important. And then finally, the satraps. Uh, this is kind of their local provinces. You know, we have states in, our, in the United States. Uh, they had satraps. And so each one kind of had local government and some power with that. Um, so here's some examples of artwork coming from that. Actually, this is Alex the Great, which is he's Greek and he's the one who conquers Persia, but he's, I kind of think of him with Persia because, you know, around the same time. So let's talk about China for a little bit. Uh, in the classical era, there's two major civilizations, dynasties that you should know. The first is the Qin dynasty. They're the ones that really unify China. The first two that happen, the Shang and the Zhao, aren't necessarily, you know, totally unified. And then also, there's some time in between them. And so after the Zhao falls, the Qin are the ones that reunify China and they're the ones that implement legalism. This is a real big focus on laws. And, and they're also incredibly centralized. So they're ruling from one place. The Qin Dynasty, by the way, only lasts for 14 years, but they're incredibly important in their lasting influence. The Han Dynasty is what you'll talk about most in terms of China in the classical era. They're the ones that are really in charge of the Silk Roads out in the east. Chang'an is their, their city capital. Um, and paper is like one of the most important contributions that the Han make to human society with their innovations. And so just to like kind of break down a little bit more for you, the belief system in the Qin Dynasty is legalism. This is like a strict system of rewards and punishments. Whereas the Han are more Confucius, Confucian. And so Confucianism would be like in the last video we mentioned, focused on education, focused on relationships. And so there's a little bit of a difference there. Some of the major people that you can know, um, Qin Shi Huang is in the Qin Dynasty. Han Wudi would be the Han Dynasty. These are sort of the first emperors in each one. And then their contributions. The Great Wall started in the Qin Dynasty, and the Han Dynasty has paper, calendars, sundials, and then the Silk Roads. So this is some of the most important facts to know about them. Um, and you can see here just how big Han Dynasty was. I mean, in the classical era, that's a massive amount of land to rule over. And they were incredibly efficient with how they did it. Uh, all right, moving over to India. There are two Indian dynasties that you should know about in the classical era. The first is the Mauryan dynasty. The second is the Gupta dynasty. So the Mauryan dynasty is connected to Ashoka. Ashoka, of course, represented Buddhism and the rock, with the rock and pillar edicts that we talked about in 2.1. And those are kind of the, the most important like terms that you should be able to associate with the Mauryan dynasty. The Gupta is much more um, like kind of a time of peace. It's almost like the golden age of classical India. And so what you're going to see in the Gupta dynasty is a lot of science and technological developments. Because when there's times of peace, people innovate. People think of new ideas. You have time to do it because you don't have to worry about your next food or, you know, survival. And so just a little bit about them. While the Mauryan were Buddhist because of Ashoka, the Guptas were more Hindu. And there were still plenty of Hindus in the Mauryan dynasty, but because of Ashoka, a lot of people converted to Buddhism. Um, there's also uh, 
the spread of Buddhism is like one of the most important pieces of the Mauryan dynasty. And then, like I had said before, the Gupta dynasty, golden age. The, the like actual number zero comes out of the Gupta dynasty. Any of the other Roman numerals, the idea of pi, right? So these are some really high level innovations that they made. So here you can see just the general size difference of the two. The Gupta dynasty was, was much smaller than the Mauryan dynasty and neither one totally conquered the entire subcontinent. All right, moving over to Greece and the, the Hellenistic society. If you ever see the word Hellenistic, that's referring directly to Greek things. Um, so anything having to do with that. Some of the key ideas would be like, you know, democracy, although it wasn't totally the same type of democracy that we know today. It looks a lot different. But just the idea that people have a say in government is different. And that is a Greek contribution. Um, and then the philosophers, their their philosophies are incredibly important. Um, here's uh, the... This is in Athens, so you can see what Greek architecture looked like with the columns, and it's very specific. And so when you see that anywhere else in the world, that's like a spread of Hellenistic ideas, Hellenistic architecture. In Rome, Rome is going to come up a lot in this time period um, because it takes up a lot of time. So one thing to remember is that there are actually three time periods of Rome. There's the kingdom, there's the republic, and then there's the empire. Most of what you're going to read about in AP World is about the Empire and a little bit about the Republic, but it's really mostly focused on the Empire. The Republic ends with the death of a Caesar. The Empire begins with the rise of Augustus. And so in terms of the Roman Republic and Empire, I'm sort of skipping the kingdom here because it won't really come up too much. The Republic is Hellenistic. They're, you know, really influenced by Greece and, and kind of pagan in terms of their belief systems. Christianity will come about during the empire and Constantine will submit the Edict of Milan in 313 and that will allow Christianity to be legal in the Roman Empire and then will after that become the dominant religion in the Roman Empire. And so just like a few people to know, you know, you have Augustus, you have Caesar, um, the Republic is important for codifying the laws and for expanding those laws. The empire, one of the uh, contributions they made is the actual calendar we use, Latin as a language, which is, you know, a basis of all the other Romantic languages. And obviously Rome at its height in its empire was massive. It conquered, it had the entire Mediterranean basin. Um, and so actually one of the reasons why they fall is because it's too big. How do you honestly support and keep in control people that far away when they don't even really identify as as Roman. Um, another uh, important contribution from the Romans is the aqueducts. And so anytime you see any of these around, it's an irrigation system. But you can see the spread of Roman influence because of architecture like this. Okay, and then one last uh, part of the world to focus on is Mesoamerica. So plenty of contributions coming there. You have Teotihuacan, you have the Mayans, and the Mochi. The actual, all of them are very similar, just like to the other classical empires. Uh, this is an example of the monumental architecture in Mesoamerica and how it still kind of looks like that pyramid, right? It's just kind of, you know, again, not the aliens, um, but just kind of a similar Similar things are happening across the world. Um, so quickly to just kind of hit on rise and fall. In general, civilizations rise because they have the means to organize themselves. They are bureaucratic. They have laws. They have roads. They have a military. They have slavery to build things. So as soon as as a city, as a society, you have the structures in place to run all of these things efficiently, you're now an empire and you can grow. All of them fall for similar reasons. All of them damage their environment because of agriculture and military, you know, conquests. And so damaging the environment is not so good for keeping your empire healthy. All of them have some kind of outside invasion um, where they have invaders coming in. It's usually like kind of the last straw. You're already pretty weak and now the invaders can take you over. All of them have different revolts and, you know, 
protests that happen within their societies. Some of those even last for like a decade. And then, you know, just the general spread of disease and overextension. So the reason why they all fall is very similar. And I'm going to make a specific video about the fall of empires. But here's just a quick overview of exactly what you need to know. So I'll be back for one point or 2.3. We'll finish up the classical era with trade. So stick around and I'll see you in the last video. Thanks for watching this five above review. Be sure to hit subscribe for more AP content and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at thinkfiveable.